So welcome everybody. This is the uh, a session organized by the Digital Classics Association entitled Digital Classics and the Changing Profession. Um, we, the question that uh, drove, um, I should say that we, when we started the Digital Classics Association four years ago, uh, our goal was to try to raise, raise awareness of current digital classics work and bring it to uh, greater attention in the broader classics community. Uh, this came from a belief that it had uh, considerable potential that could be for, more fully and quickly realized if it was better connected with the broader field of classics. Uh, our first three sessions over the last three years at the AIA SCS meetings were dedicated uh, respectively to introducing some current digital classics work to the potential of analyzing large data sets and last year to pedagogy and outreach. Uh, over this time, the extent and significance of digital work in classics has continued to grow. It therefore seemed like an opportune moment at the largest professional meeting of classicists in North America to take stock of the significance of this work for how we define and structure our profession and how we might do so in the future. So our panelists today are going to explore the subject of digital classics and the changing profession um, offering their perspectives on uh, how the availability of digital tools and the potential for digital work are changing, making for a different uh, professional landscape. Um, one quick program note before we get started. Uh, two, the order of two of the presentations is going to be reversed. Uh, so uh, number two, speaking in the second slot, will be Christopher Johansson. And uh, taking his slot will be Bruce Robertson. So those switching positions two and five for those of you. Uh, following along. So um, without further ado, we have uh, five excellent and experienced uh, digital classicists uh, to get us, uh, to inform us about this topic. And we'll begin with uh, Gregory Crane of Leipzig University and Tufts University. Okay. Well, okay. All right, so anything with plugs uh, is always kind of a challenge. All right, so I'm going to be going pretty quickly, and I changed, modified the, the title of my talk to reflect some changes of what we're doing in Germany. Uh, and so I'm really talking about Greco-Roman studies, which means Greek and Latin, classics, which I think needs to be broader, uh, and global philology, whatever that is. And I just, so philology, apparently people can't, it's hard to explain. I have a very simplistic model of it, which comes from this Latin quotation, which I first heard when I was 17 years old from Cedric Whitman. Uh, and basically philology is the scientia totius, or scientia, or cognitio, excuse me, universi antiquitatis, historica et philosophica. Basically, it's, Anything you can understand about the past in your brain, philosophica, or out in the world from the textual record. And I take that to be an extensive uh, uh, program of anything, any method, any set of questions, any theory. It's all subsumed under the task of philology. And I always try to start with that, to reemphasize to, to, to us, to reemphasize to the world the importance fundamentally of the kind of thing that we do. Uh, and philology is relentlessly data-driven. Anyone who sat through the American election uh, knows we need more data-driven discussion uh, and that the philological impulse needs to be reestablished. All right, now three reasons for a talk for a global philology going beyond Greek and Latin. There's some of these, I won't talk about the third, pragmatic. Basically, you want to combine many disciplines together to amortize the cost. It's really expensive. But I'll talk a little bit about social, political, and economic context for our work, as well as intellectual goals. Uh, and first, the humanities in general. Uh, in Germany, there's much satisfaction at the fact that uh, the humanities as a whole are doing well. We have more students than 10 years ago, as opposed to Japan and uh, the USA and Canada. And so you know, here's an article about how great it is and, and so on. Uh, it's not so great elsewhere, you know, here, at least in the Maritimes in Canada, uh, enrollments have not been so good, except for Mount Allison. Uh, no surprise, given who's representing it. Uh, and in Germany, 
we have more professors than we did 20 years ago, 20% uh, more. But even in Germany, where the humanities as a whole are flourishing, alte Sprachen und Unkulturen, ancient languages and cultures, are getting hammered. Die stehen im Abbau. Uh, lovely expression. Uh, they are being uh, dismantled. Uh, and uh, it is in part to address this need, this challenge, that we receive support from the German government to think about global philology and what digital technology can do for it. I'll point out that America, at least the United States, where we have figures, figures from the Modern Language Association, unfortunately not the SCS, about enrollments in Greek and Latin, we did remarkably well for 40 years, from 1968 to 2009. Our enrollments were pretty stable. Uh, but between 2009 and 2013, we took big hits. 15% decline in Latin, 20% in Greek. Whether that's a blip because of the crisis or a trend remains to be seen. But we have our challenges, even though we've done pretty well, I have to say, the Americans have. Uh, so th things are tough all over. But still, even though we have our own Greco-Roman world, we really represent the leading figures, leading disciplines, or discipline, I guess, uh, in working with historical languages, at least in the US. Uh, again, for the Modern Language Association, we have about 14,000 students of Biblical Hebrew. But if you put Biblical Hebrew, Greek, and Latin together, the Renaissance big three, that's 96% of all enrollments in historical languages. Everybody else uh, is uh, together less than 5%. So if you're going to have an infrastructure for Akkadian or for Sanskrit in this country, it's got to build off of Greek and Latin, which is sort of an obligation and an opportunity. So we have this project running in Germany. At least one or two of you are going to be are participating in this. Uh, if you're interested in, in this general thread, let me know. We're trying to get as much information as possible. And uh, let me see. And here are statistics uh, of the collapse uh, of, uh, as I say, of these, of these languages. Basically, this is our purview. If you could read the slide, you would see it's a whole bunch of ancient languages. All right, so the real question, it's hard to, to, to ask the real question, I think, in this, at this convention where we're looking at each other. And you know, this is where we get to be with our colleagues, and we all have sort of a shared background but the real question isn't what we think of each other, it's what the rest of the world thinks of us. Why is there a field of classics? What is the field of classics? Why do we have departments? Uh, I had like, two different deans when I was chair, and each one started by either telling me they were getting rid of classics or telling me classics would go away. Uh, so I'm used to this kind of challenge. And so how do we understand what is the relationship between what we do and our understanding of our cultural heritage in our various countries? Uh, you can think of connectivity to the outside world. You can see here US exports. The United States is an island nation. You can see that. And it's pretty ba well balanced between uh, Europe and Asia uh, in terms of its economic inputs. Do not underestimate the importance of this in shaping our subjects. Canada, which I feel I have to include, is kind of interesting. Uh, I guess Canada sort of funnels through the US to all these places. Uh, but China, as a major cultural, major economic partner and a source of immigration, uh, how does that reflect? Would, how would that reflect your priorities if you're Canadian? I'm not. So that's a question, not a statement. And Germany, we're really European. By the way, I'm paid to say we when that's German. Uh, it's not just, it's so, okay. Uh, I, I am a paid agent of a foreign power. I'm, I'm, that's not a joke. I literally am. It's in, my, it's in my position. So just to be transparent, unlike some elected members of our government, perhaps. Um, so it's not just trade and economics, but it's also population. And here are some statistics that now everybody knows who was following the U.S. election about the changing U.S. demographics. Most, those of you who are young will live to a period when we probably there is no majority ethnic group in the United States. 
Uh, and in fact, a, tremendous, a lot of our immigration is now going to come from Asia, Asia writ broadly, including the Indian subcontinent. Uh, what are your, if you're 25 or 30 years old, what kind of a department are you going to have when you're an old geezer like me? Uh, what, who are you serving? What does classics mean? Uh, it's not, in, in the United States, it's not just a European cultural heritage. Here as a slide for Canada, uh, basically what this is saying is uh, native-born Canadians are vanishing, uh, and the only way to increase population here uh, is by immigration. And the immigration in Canada comes from the Philippines, India, China, Iran, Pakistan, Syria, and then the USA. That the USA figure may increase uh, <laughs> in the next few months. Uh, but this again, who are your new citizens? Uh, and in Germany, you know, you go between really bad depopulation and catastrophic depopulation, uh, depending on, and that's even, even including immigration. How do you, you need to bring people in and they're not coming from Italy, uh, they're coming from someplace else. How do you create a vision of the past, a discipline that helps build, pull countries together, uh, we have all sorts of issues in Germany. This is, they use the term multiculti, which I put in quotations. And if, if I said that in English, I'd get fired, I think. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and it depends on, on immigration. So the question is, how do you fashion a culture that Im integrates immigrants culturally as well as economically? And it, I think this is a central question for us uh, as um, classes. And I think, in fact, if you look think in the big picture, our field, in my view, is categorized by the idea of Europe, not as a narrow Eurocentric little piece of the world, but Europe as bigger than your, your kingdom or the, the, the electorate or the duchy of which you were a part. Europe as a transnational, as a cosmopolitan idea. Uh, and it is this element, this cosmopolitan, this open vision uh, of, say, early modern Latin, or as publica literarum, that we need to, to extend. Okay, so what's, a, what's the model? Okay, now intellectual motivations, very quickly. Uh, we got a lot of data. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of uh, millions of books. Germany, we have a lot of books uh, and uh, of all kinds. And there, you can now you can turn them into useful text, which is what this is. And if you have a lot of text, you can do interesting things like extract. This is a visualization of the history of Islam or component of the history of Islam, uh, and it has places and networks, and you know things get bigger, which means they get more important. I think almost anybody can figure out the point of this, and it is extracted from the source text. Uh, but the problem is the source text looks like that. Uh, and I don't think very many of the people in this room can read that source text. How do you examine the content? How do you examine the source materials? Uh, another example familiar to some of you, the Patrologia Graeca, which has about 35 million words of Greek. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how many people has, have actually read the entire, all the authors? in that, not necessarily in those editions, but in the best editions. Somebody, some people probably have. Your PhD reading list was a million words. So this is 35 times the size of that PhD reading list. Uh, how, do you, how do you process that? Now we have lots of methods. Here's a thing called topic modeling. And this clump of words uh, spikes in a couple of different, in this book, Clearly, we've got some kind of idea, association. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But of course, the issue, you know, this is all Greek. And for the, of course, for the old days, this is the old lobes. They had a Latin translation for those of you who couldn't read your Greek. Uh, not terribly helpful now to many of us. But again, you butt up against the fact that you can do the big data thing. You can analyze and visualize the data, but you cannot critically analyze uh, the results. And that's, I think, the big, a huge, big challenge. We're looking at what's called the long tail issue, where all of a sudden you have tons and tons of material out there, and people are much more varied in their interests than you would have thought when they just were working with small collections. 
but you had these intellectual challenges. You know, here's a Stanford Ancient Chinese and Mediterranean Empires Comparative History Project, Greek, Chinese, Latin, Coptic, Syriac. If you can read all those languages, I don't want to know about it because I don't want to be depressed. Uh, you know, here, uh, another course uh, on uh, Assyrian and, and Greek warfare, uh, Greco-Roman or Greco-Arabic philosophy, uh, and uh, world literature, which is only taught in English, Isn't that, which I find really depressing. So let me look. It all boils down to, let's go to a point in time, Vienna, 1679, you have plague, a third of everybody dies. Uh, inconceivable catastrophe to those of us living in the United States or Europe of our age. Uh, 1683, you have the Ottoman army at the gates of Vienna and the um, last and the, the great battle defeats them. And in between, you have this. This is a summary grammar in Latin of Turkish, uh, Arabic, and Persian. The most boring thing in the world, the most interesting thing in the world, a thing written in Latin. Imagine this thing being produced in that context. And it's, this is a document ubiquitously available in the German Digital Library Open Access. If we translated this, nobody can read this, virtually nobody. If we can make this intellectually accessible, what does it tell us uh, about, you know, about, in various ways, about uh, European attitudes towards the Middle East? And how do you deal with this? And in fact, this book gives you examples. This is the first translation of the Persian poet Hafez uh, into a, a European language, a chunk of it translated here. Uh, and you get a Persian transcription. You get a transliteration. You get a Latin translation in the international language of the time, an explication of the meter, and then you get a word-by-word -word linguistic, you know, linguistic glossing of the form of every word. And these methods are thus are the methods that we need to use now. The challenge is generating this kind of information for 100 million words of classical Greek or Latin, or for billions of words of post-classical Latin, for example. Uh, so we need, now there are methods to deal with this. Your, uh, linguists are, there are modern methods of dealing with this. Linguists have the things called the Leipzig glossing rules, so they can work with hundreds of languages uh, and do something with them with some kind of precision. And these have been adapted to ancient Egyptian. Uh, and uh, here's, you can hear the Rosetta Stone, the Egyptian, the demotic version of it, every word and every morpheme analyzed. You should be able to teach this in a class uh, and have your students encounter the Egyptian as a classicist, knowing the limitations of this. But this is a new form of publication. And we have it in things like morphosyntactic analysis, uh, annotation, tree banks, which are a way of representing uh, syntactic relationships, aligned translations, uh, where you can see which words uh, are aligned to which words. And I think the real challenge for us uh, is scale. So when I first was at the APA, as it was then quaintly called, uh, in 1979 in Boston, when I was a first-year graduate student, uh, and, and it's remarkably similar, uh, you know, this was the world um, that uh, I was focused on. And this is bad enough. Believe me, we all know how hard it is to deal with this. But I think we really need to think about this. Uh, the political, this is you know, one generic map. Uh, and the point is we need to think about the Greco-Roman world as part of a larger Eurasian system. Uh, and we need to think about the world, even when the world is split and probably not interacting in any direct way. How do we support a classics department where our students can engage with the primary materials here? Uh, finally, you can't just do this by ourselves. Uh, we need to actually engage people from outside the world. I think we should be reading Hafez, classical Persian poetry, in a classics department. Uh, and I would stake that out. Uh, and, but here, an alignment, you know, a method to start to get people into the Persian. Uh, how do you think about, say, translations or in, uh, of other classical literatures 
into modern languages? How do you get past the Orientalist uh, trap where you know, it's us talking about them? Well, I think we need to exploit new methods, not only of transportation, but of also of direct interaction, video conferencing, and so on. Here's a, uh, a meeting. Oh my God, I have two minutes. Uh, a meeting between my colleagues uh, in the, at the U of T. You know, U of T, if someone calls you up and says the U of T and you guess wrong, you're in big trouble. Uh, this is the University of Tehran. Uh, how, imagine reading Herodotus in Tehran, or working with people reading Herodotus in Tehran, or talking to people in Tehran uh, about Emerson translating, or work trying to produce versions of classical Persian poetry uh, in English. Uh, think about um, dialogues with people from other classical traditions. So I'll finish just by saying, what would a classics, a real classics major look like that would be sustainable in the 21st century? Uh, and I, was just, I would say, you know, one, one modern language, not, and, and not a national language, i.e. French doesn't count in Canada something other than beyond French and English. You should know French if you're Canadian. Uh, one ancient language. Uh, I think you should have uh, at least three semesters of hardcore computer science, uh, if you can do it. Though we're working to give you a semester of uh, basically data science. I think Marie Claire will talk about that a little bit later. But some kind of grounding on how to work with data. You need to have some kind of a, a capstone project uh, that ties everything together. And you need to be trained both to, to develop mastery in one subject uh, and the ability, mastery in one language, and the ability to work with many other languages where you do not have mastery. I think this kind of an educational program is one that would put our students in a very advantageous position, uh, paying off their student debts, uh, and also contributing more seriously as citizens uh, and members of a global society. How do we train the teachers for that? How do we, what do the professors look like? What does the field look like to do this? I don't know. So I pose that question for discussion. So thank you very much. So we're going to take one or two questions after each speaker and then hold the remaining time for general discussion at the end. So Greg, you want to field? Yes. So um, thanks for another great big picture pick in the um, intelligent parts. Uh, I was uh, struck by your description of a future politics department, and it sounds actually really similar to a modern linguistics department in the, uh, the potential, at least, for emphasis on data, computer science, mastering one language. And in particular, you were referring to the Leipzig annotation, which is yeah. a linguistic yeah. approach. Um, should classics departments be looking at combining with linguistics departments, which are science and not humanities, or should they be looking at uh, creating a sort of separate entity? I mean, uh, if, if you were talking to a dean who was troubled by redundancy, what would you say? Well, there, you're probably not redundant with the linguistics department because you probably don't have one. Uh, and, uh, but I think that uh, the most important discipline from which philologists, students of Greek and Latin, I think really need to learn is corpus linguistics. Because if you're not, you know, we're, we're corpus linguists, we just don't know what we're doing. Uh, and there's a generation of work that's been done in this field. Com computational linguistics as well, which is a related but completely different discipline. Uh, I th we do not want to be subsets of these, but we need to extract and build upon the results, crit build critically upon the results of those areas. The separation between linguistics and the study of language has not been particularly good for us, or for linguistics. I think. Yes? I don't know how this relates to the drop off in the enrollment in classics specifically. But now, I live in New York, but I have a friend who teaches art history at the University of Alabama. And she told me that their College of Liberal Arts is thinking of changing the name of the college because the word liberal means bad things politically in Alabama. <laughs> I don't know if anybody here is from Alabama. Yeah, um, well, I would say, 
the lesson I take from this election was that in places like Alabama, there's very little confidence that people like us care about them. Uh, and very little sense that what we do has any, is designed with any kind of relevance to them or to help them. Uh, and uh, I think there, and the, there's a certain amount of perception of disdain, and I think there may be some justification for that. But maybe just if you live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very much,